Welcome to Butterflies of Wisdom, everyone. And this morning with me, I have Mike Morrell. Mike Morrell is one of those fabulous fans of mine who I actually know personally, believe it or not. Um, and he lives in beautiful Aspen, Colorado, where I am based as well. So we get to share the mountains together. But the reason why I'm bringing Mike back on my podcast is because he did an incredible feat. Actually, I believe two times with his brother, who's also a long time local of Aspen, and they skied cat men do. They actually hiked up and skied down, and which is a typical thing around there. You typically find these ultra guys doing that. And so if you want to go back and find out why Mike is doing what he's doing and how he's connected to Aspen, I'll put his original episode in the show notes so you guys can go back and listen to that. But without further ado, I'm going to let Mike take it away and explain his journey about doing cat man do well when thanks for having me it's always a pleasure always great to catch up with you and um you know i think that um when people talk about the moral brothers i think everest is usually something that that comes up and you know really when i when i look at at what steve and i have done i mean it started you know when we were little kids and my dad woke us up one morning on July 4th and loaded us into the station wagon and then hauled us up to Independence Pass, and we, we were introduced to the backcountry. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 53 in, in November, and um, really what, what we're talking about is, is, is more than just skiing Everest or skiing this peak or that peak. The, the, the thing that, that, that I can't stress enough is just how much fun we've had just naturally progressing. You know, we started when we were 12 years old and, and just took it to then Montezuma. And then when we got older, we ended up doing a bunch of expeditions to uh, Alaska. And then that led to, you know, high 20,000 foot peaks in South America. And, and eventually we, we found a passion through that progression to, you know, climb and ski some of the highest peaks in the world, including Everest and some of the other 8,000-meter peaks. And it's just been a, a great lifestyle. It's, it's enabled us to see the world, to, to expand on our physical abilities, our mental abilities, and we've just really had a great time with it. So we're really blessed, and, and we're proud that we uh, use Aspen as our base camp. And so it's been a fun ride. Little you use Aspen as your base <laughs> camp, and then you take off from here, obviously, and taking off from here is no easy feat, as um, people know, flying on, just to give you a logistical point of view here, even though this is a podcast, or airport is smack dab in the middle of two mountains, basically, um, or airport is closer to snowmass than it is to Aspen. And so when planes fly out, they have a chance of basically hitting those mountains. And in years past, that has happened. So flying out of here and using this as your base camp is no yeah. easy feat. I mean, flying out of Denver would be easier to cat man do than Aspen, Colorado, but you guys seem to do it. Now, do you fundraise for these trips, or how do you do it? I mean, that's what I'm fascinated about. Well, you know, when when it, it when when we were younger, we just we found the passion, and and 
it, you know, we were, obviously we gravitated towards it. I mean, I come from a ski racing family. I mean, my dad was an Olympian and my uncle was an Olympian and I never had the ability to, um, ski race like they did, but, but we were, we were strong and we loved the back country and, and it, it formed a lifestyle at a really early age that allowed us to train. So that prepared us for this natural progression of taking on a peak and then the next time pushing it a little bit further. Um, when we, when we first got out of college, you know, we were, Steve and I are both CPAs and we, we had jobs that allowed us to, you know, contemplate spending a little bit of money and I didn't have any kids or any responsibilities and we would save our pennies and, you know, then we started flying up to the Northwest and we did some, some ski trips and, and, you know, peaks like Rainier and some of those peaks. And, and so we, through this natural progression and just taking it a little bit further, pushing our abilities, uh, it increased our experience. And over a, a, a period of time, we found ourselves pulling off some, some larger, bigger things. And then in 2000, our careers really went from, from being, you know, novice, uh, amateurs to entering a more professional level where um, after we skied a peak called Shishapangma, which is uh, just over 26,000 feet, we gained a little bit of notoriety and we gained a little bit of experience to sell ourselves. And, and so then we were able to keep up with our progression because as you get into those bigger peaks, it's expensive and and so you have to find ways to fund it. And, and we were able to leverage our story uh, to do films and to raise money through sponsors and to, to get the gear and, and, and that al- allowed us to just continue with the, the progression and, and, you know, really, it, it, I, I don't want to say that we're athletes in a sport, but it allowed us to literally create a, a lifestyle that is conducive to that kind of stuff. And it really is, it's a passion. And, um, you know, the, the, the message is, it, yeah, it's dangerous and it's risky, but if you prepare and, and you take that natural progression, what I would recommend to listeners is, you know, find your passion and don't let anybody tell you it's too dangerous or too risky or that you're not capable. Find that passion and you just follow that passion uh, to its end. And, and that's, that's what yeah. we've done. And so far we're not at the end. We're still out there climbing and skiing. I definitely agree. I, I definitely agree. And, um, because of where we live, um, most athletes come here to Colorado to train. You and I have the advantage. I know most triathletes, when I was a triathlete, and I was, um, people were fascinated that I lived at a high altitude and People were fascinated that I had the advantage on them, despite my cerebral palsy, that I yep. could train every two seconds at a high altitude. I mean, most skiers come to this high altitude to train for Kathmandu, to train for the higher mountain peaks, just so yeah. they get their one straight. But you and I have the advantage of going to a bike ride at this yeah. high altitude and thinking nothing of it. Yeah. Well, there's no, there's no doubt when, I mean, you know, being fourth generation at Aspen and, and living at 8,000 feet, I mean, the vast majority of people that, that climb in the Andes and in the Himalaya, you know, they come from metropolitan areas that are, you know, literally at sea level or near sea level and to, to have that advantage of living at 8,000 feet and having the ability to, um, you know, climb to 12, 13, and even 14,000 feet on a regular basis. It, it's been an unfair advantage to us and we've, we've taken advantage of it and it allows us to get to base camp in, in Tibet or Nepal acclimated, um, you know, at, to, at a minimum you know, 8,000 feet and, and with the training on some of the local peaks even higher. And it, it, it catapults us ahead in, in, an, in the expedition compared to people that are coming from sea level by, by weeks. So it's, it's a huge yeah, advantage. Yeah, weeks. 
but the the cool thing is that yeah, the cool thing is that you know the the Elk Mountains, you know they're not the biggest and they're not the most difficult to climb. But you know, having been in in the, in the greater ranges, you know, the, the majority of my life, they're definitely the most beautiful peaks. And and just the lifestyle and living here and and growing up here and now raising my two kids, um, just blessed. I mean, it's just a gift, and and I don't take that for granted. No, I don't take that for granted either, Mike. You know that I don't take that for granted. And the fact of the matter is we are so blessed to be living where we're living. I mean, we have Mother Nature two seconds away out our front doors, by the way, and we can go for hikes and just do the training on an uh, everyday basis, whereas most people can't. They yeah. have to drive to do their training and then figure out, oh, how we're going to do this. First, stop in space camp and then climb and then yeah. um, go further up. Now, did you have to do the base camp dance, like I like to call it, or did you have that advantage? Did you guys have that advantage, or did you still have to do the base camp first and then climb and then get down oh, yeah. to base camp? Yeah, no, when, when we get to the base of a peak, you know, it's a it's a pretty standard protocol. I mean, the, the base camps in the Himalaya are anywhere from fifteen to 17,000 feet, so it's still significantly higher than, you know, even the highest peaks here in Colorado. So we still have to go through the process of acclimating, and, and you know, typically it takes roughly a week to acclimate to any given altitude, and so what you do is you set up a, a base camp where you're comfortable. You make sure you're acclimated to that. That's your safety net, and uh, then you just you start heading up the mountain, and you put in a camp or two or maybe even three on some of the bigger peaks, and you the, the process of climbing up to a camp and going back down not only stocks the upper camps, but it allows you to acclimate, and, and the, the formula is generally climb high and sleep low so you can rest. And after a week or two of, of establishing a route, then you take a few days off, and then you get up the early in the morning and you just blast up the mountain and everything is set so all you got to do is carry your skis and head on up yeah exactly and now you didn't have the Sherpas aspect when you did um the big climb in the himalayas you didn't have anyone carrying your pack or maybe you did i don't even know i um i presume you guys did it independently, just the two of you. Yeah. Well, in in our in our uh, careers, we have have made it a, a a rule to climb by what they call pure style, and pure style doesn't include having you know Sherpa or porters carry your gear. Uh, it doesn't include the use of supplemental oxygen or any kind of altitude drugs, and 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 we're purists and. It's not to say that we haven't had um, one or two climbs where we have employed Sherpa. Uh, we have, um, but the, the, it's a rarity, and it's only on one or two climbs. And, and the, the drastic difference that it makes, um, you know, even to have a, a Sherpa, you know, between three guys, one Sherpa, it's, it's a monumental um, perk, and, and, and that's kind of by and large the standard of the commercial climbing where they have, you know, over a porter per person. Um, so we really appreciate the, the, the pure style, and, and ironically, later in life, we just adhere to it even more. I mean, we just don't use any kind of, of help on the mountain. And, and that the, the, the reason for that is just it's a, it's a style thing. We're proud of it, but um, we're, we're able to do it, and it's, it's enormously satisfying. And, and, you know, we've lost some summits because of our – steadfastness uh, to that pure style of climbing. But when you look in the annals of mountaineering, you know, the the heavy hitters and the, and the, and the greats all time did not use uh, anything other than the pure style. And it's not to say that we consider ourselves to be the greats of all time, but it's fun to emulate them. It's fun to try. And, and when you do that, you have a benchmark. 
and you can see how you do compare to the the, the legends of of the sport. So um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a conscious decision, and it's uh, it's one that 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 you know we really enjoy, and it's very satisfying. Now you told me, which I'm very proud of, because you said that yours truly me inspired you to write a book. And now is this on mountain climbing or is this on CPA stuff, (laughs) aka tax stuff? Oh, what is this book? Oh. Well, when it, it, it's, it's, you did inspire me, and you didn't inspire me to just, um, write the book, but, um, you know, when I look at, at your career, and then I had another really close friend, Jimmy Huga, who had MS, um, and, and when I see how people succeed, despite the difficulties that they, they have with the cards they've been dealt in life, people like you become a huge source of inspiration, and, when I read your your first two books, it 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 was it was not only was it great writing and were they really good stories, but um, I, I just it was another challenge. And I'm not a writer; I'm a numbers guy, so I'm kind of a square peg in a circle world. Yes. And 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 yes, a, a few years ago, yeah, I just started writing and and I concentrated on wordsmithing and 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 you know Googled you know structure and and and, and Roger, my brother, who writes a column in the Aspen Times, helped me. And I just became entranced in in telling my story. And it, it's a climbing book. It's 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 called Natural Progression, and um, it really just starts at the beginning and just kind of is a autobiography that that covers how we did it. And and I'm just having a, a really good time with it. And and I'm I'll probably finish it this month. And I don't have any goals. I, I don't have any any ambition to get it published. But I just wanted to write a book, and I wanted to get it written down. And and uh, you know, I'll I'll shop it out there and see what people think. And if it's something that people want to read, you know, part of the issue that I have with with the mountaineering is that it's a super uh, selfish type activity. Because yeah. when I'm out there having fun, my family is at home worried about me and. And there's not a lot I can do about that. And it's not just family, it's friends, it's everybody. And for me it's to fun. share the story is a way that I can, you know, in my mind anyways, mitigate that that selfishness. So I'm having a good time with it. Well, I was going to say self-publishing is the easiest thing on the planet. And uh, this goes out to any of my fans. For those of you who want to write a book and self-publish it, I would be happy to guide you through this process, including Mike, because I think his story is incredible. He has two stories, one about Mountain Alien and one about being a long-time Aspen local, which we talked about before. So, yes, you have two stories in there, Mike. And um, I didn't know until you told me that your father was Olympian. Yeah. And so what um, Olympics did he compete in? Dad was uh, an alpine ski racer, and he competed in the 1960 Olympics and was on the U.S. ski team for a little over a decade. And uh, yeah. he he the reason why he got us into ski mountaineering is that Back in the 50s and 60s when he was racing, um, the U.S. ski team did do training trips to South America and to Europe on the glaciers and stuff like that. But Dad came from a, a family with, with limited means, and, and back then the ski team was just a small organization, and if you had enough money to join them, you could. Um, you know, they paid for the the racing and stuff during the season, but for the training and the off season, it was it was tough. And so what he did is he would head up to the high peaks around here, and he would smooth out the snow and the cirques of some of the peaks, and and he would train. And and it, it got him in really good shape, and it got him strong, and he got his ski miles in. And um, so it, it it was his base camp, but he he passed that love of the backcountry on to us, and, um, you know, here we are today. 
And I presume, because you told me this before you have kids, I presume you're passing the love of that country on to them, or are you... Yeah, you know, I mean, the one thing I learned doing having... that, or are you making them saying it's up to you guys, I'm here to support you? Well, the one thing I learned with Dad, you know, when you grow up in Aspen, Colorado, and your dad is an Olympic ski racer, that's a big shadow. And he he, he yeah. never pushed me into anything. And, and when I had, you know, I adopted both my kids from China, and when, when they came into the picture before he died... Um, he made it clear that, you know, you can't push kids. I mean, kids are, you know, you point them, but you can't push them. And he never was an overbearing parent. He never pushed me into ski racing or anything that I did. He just encouraged me when I did it. And that's kind of the line that I take with my kids. And one of them likes to ski and one of them doesn't ski at all. And that's, that's fine. It's, it's whatever they want to do. Yeah. So as long as we had supported family that um technically fine if we come from you either have we both come from the philosophy of you either have to be a doctor a lawyer or a teacher not necessarily a cpa cpa <laughs> but um if it's something you enjoy do it do it that's right i mean i as i as i said in my family know this too. I'm sending myself back to journalism school. Thank God my family's supportive. And yeah. I am planning on getting the professional training in journalism because I want to make this podcast bigger and better and my writing bigger and better. Well, it's, I mean, when it's just a beautiful thing that you're doing and I've followed your career and and uh, gotten to know you as an adult, um, and, and what you're doing is, is really no different than what I'm doing. I mean, you're just, you're, you're taking your life and you're pointing it in a direction and you're, you're, you, you know, you're diving in head first and you're going for it. And, um, you know, I think that, um, the, the overall message that I've learned from the, the climbing and the skiing is that, you know, you, people tell you that you can do anything that you want if you just apply yourself. And, and, and that's, that's not true, and people kind of cringe when I say that. It, it's not true. I mean, I wasn't able to get some summits that I really wanted to, and I can tell you that I gave it everything I had. But what I do know with without fail is that if people just find a passion or find a project and, and, and just try and, and give it everything you got, it's guaranteed that you can do a hell of a lot more than you ever thought you could. You just have to try, and you have to – enjoy the process the, the 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 fault that i find with a lot of young people and a lot of adults is that they they set a goal i want to be a major league baseball player or i want to be a millionaire by age 35 or i want to do this and they set that goal and that's fine goals are good but it comes at the expense of enjoying the process of getting from where you are now to getting to that goal and 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 what i have found in my career is that when I really started to enjoy the climbing and skiing, all of the accomplishments started to happen without any effort. Because if you enjoy what you're doing, you do a better job, and you don't have time to think about the accomplishments. They just happen. And before you know it, you get to where that goal was, and you wake up and you've exceeded it. And and, and that's that's the big message that, uh, you know, I try to relate as a comes from my career so enjoy the process because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow you might as well enjoy today yep yep you never know what's going to happen tomorrow and i um i don't know if you read in the paper mike that um duck dukowski passed away and the reason why i bring um him up is because he co-delivered me and I still hold the record, you guys, for being the smallest baby born at AVH, one pound, <laughs> 13 ounces. Wow. Thank you very much. And so, um, yeah. So, wow. Dr. Kasky co-delivered me, and everyone thought he was crazy when he closed his um, 
classes in Dallas and moved to a small town, Aspen, Colorado, everyone thought he was nuts. But he said, I want to do this. I believe in my passion. I want to go help deliver kids. And, yeah. And there you so go. You believe in your passion, and the work doesn't seem like work. Yep. That's a great story. So, I didn't know that. Yes, yes. Now you know an interesting fact about me that um, a lot of people don't know. They know it's through my book, but this is the first time I actually said it, said that on my podcast. Mm-hmm. So before I let you go back to your CPA life and your <laughs> extraordinary life and climbing big, huge mountains here. Uh, I want you to ask me a couple questions that you think the public should know about me. Well, when I think that um, when I look at you, it's just one question. It, it's the, the energy and, and the positive vibe that that I get from you, it, it kind of goes back to that inspirational part that I was talking about. I mean, why is it that that people like you, and, and I'm not talking about you in, in relationship to cerebral palsy. I'm just talking, what is it about people that have that positive mental outlook? I mean, is that something you're born with? Is it, if not, is it something you develop? I mean, how have you nurtured that in your life? Well, I um, I don't know if you know this, but I was very lucky to go to a private school, Country Day, Aspen Country Day, and hang out with able-bodied kids all day. None okay. of my classmates were disabled. I was the only disabled person in the class of 2000 that graduated from country day. Mm-hmm. And so I think growing up around kids that were doing things 10 times better than I was, I think that instilled the positive attitude still to this day because I never saw a disabled kid. I yeah. never ever saw a disabled person. I never saw a disabled kid in my life and until I got older and that's why it's so difficult for me to be in the disabled community because even though I need support um, with my cerebral palsy, I'm not necessarily in the disabled community yeah. because I don't need that negative, disabled, heebie attitude with yeah. a lot of disabled things. So uh-huh. it's it's a fine line, and it's extremely difficult. I mean, people look at me like you, thinking, what is Wynn doing next? <laughs> and um, so I, it's a fine line because yeah. um, the disabled community gets down on themselves very easily, and yeah. depression is huge with the disabled community and, you know, with dealing with CTA stuff. It's a fine line, basically, the t- child, any child with a non-disability, but yeah. add in the expenses of a disability on top of it. So it's a fine line that I walk. It's like walking a tight rope, you guys. I walk that tight rope every single day, and I try to keep a positive attitude, and it's a fine line. Yeah. Well, it's inspirational, as I as I indicated earlier, and um, I love your books and your podcast, and, uh, you know, anything I can do to help you out. Um, let me know, but it's fun to well, catch up I with will. you and talk with you. So it's uh, I will. yeah, it's very inspiring. Right, it's been great, and I'm sure that if people want to get a hold of you about 
tips about mountains and stuff climbing, not necessarily about CPA work until at <laughs> least April or maybe even February. Don't bother Mike in April, please, because that's the worst time to bother a CPA. I have family members that are CPAs too, and I don't bother them in April. I don't bother <laughs> any CPAs in April. That's Bad win, bad win if I do that. And so, where can people find you if they want to get a uh, hold of you more about mountain climbing yeah. and maybe a little bit of CPA work going in there for good measure? Yeah, they can. They can find me on social media, Facebook, Mike Meralt, or they can go to uh, my business website, which is eight kpeak dot com. So, um, and, and you can, people can, if people want to talk about mountain climbing and skiing, they can bother me on April 15th. I, I will take the call. They, they can bother <laughs> you on April 15th. God knows I love it. So, open door uh, policy, uh, when Open door policy. And if people want to bother me about being the adaptive snowboarder that I am, they can bother me all all time is on social media to figure out how I adapt, well, adapt the least the more. I know Mike knows that because, um, as I said, I'm growing up in, well, I grew up in the beauty of Aspen, Colorado, and Mike did too. So we're in Fenway West, and I hope you guys enjoy another fabulous episode talking about 14 years and talking about inspiration and just enjoying life. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Mike, for sharing your story about your amazing feet and skiing and your little bit of family history. Thanks to you guys. Thanks, Wynn.